George Lyle went from slave to sent gospel worker. Who was George Lyle? What did he do for modern missions? And why haven't we heard of him? We'll cover that on today's episode of the Missions Podcast. But first, a message from ABWE President Paul Davis. ABWE missionaries are coming beside the lost and the hurting around the world. And through the Global Gospel Fund, they're pulling people from the darkness and training them as leaders. They're planting churches, and they're even beginning their own missions movements. You may already support one ABWE missionary. Would you consider a gift to the Global Gospel Fund to support all 1,000 of our missionaries? Thank you for that. Become a partner today at abwe.org slash global gospel fund. Welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, your host, joined by Scott Dunford, West Coast Advancement Coordinator and Lead Church Planter for Redeemer Church in Fremont, California. Scott, so glad to be with you again here today. And uh, we're bracing for some massive snow impact here soon, which will be in our rearview mirror by the time this premieres. I doubt the same thing is coming your way in the Bay Area of San Francisco. Maybe you're getting a heat wave, maybe, you know, a, a tidal wave, um, you know, maybe an EMP bomb or something. I'm, I'm not sure what what exactly happens to you this time of year. Actually, I mean, it's surprisingly sunny right now, but this time of year we get like these these torrential rains and this year has been uh we basically have a dry season and a wet season but this year has been if people can actually pray for us we had this huge tent you know because we're under pretty strict lockdown here we do have freedom to worship but we just have to worship outside and so we bought a big tent a big 80 by 40 tent and winds came through a couple weeks ago and lifted this huge tent while it was staked down and basically twisted it and just broke it Uh, and so we were excited we thought, okay, we can salvage this. And we got a few more parts. And then, uh, again, um, it came through and, and more, uh, more, more wind broke it again. And so we've kind of been in a weird situation where we've got these huge heavy winds that locals haven't seen in, in years. And, uh, and maybe in their whole lifetimes. And yet it's, so it's Mm. disrupting things for sure. So yeah, I, I would take, I, Snow is great. Uh, I love snow. Uh, these winds that destroy church meeting places, I'm not su- super fan of. No, that's that doesn't sound fun at all. Um, don't <laughs> envy the snow too much, though. Um, I wouldn't mind uh, being in a more temperate climate. Uh, before we dive into today's episode, though, we do want to ask you, since we've already really done a good job of hooking your attention by talking about the weather, um, we want to make sure that you smash the subscribe button and make sure you share this with a friend that you think will benefit from our topic today, which I'm excited to dive into. And Scott, I know this means a lot to you as well. Yeah, this is something that we've been wanting to talk about for actually quite a long time. So, February is Black History Month in America and uh, completely coincidentally, because actually this is something we've been working on for over a year. uh, Our first show of February is about the first African-American missionary uh, and coincidentally, the first American missionary and the first modern missionary. And I first heard I had heard about him before, um, but it was brought to mind actually at ETS when uh, Dr. Jason Dusing was speaking about this, you know, who, who was George Lyle. And so we're excited to have Dr. Jason Dusing. Uh, uh, Jason is a research fellow for Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission for the Southern Baptist Convention. He's the academic editor for the Midwestern Journal of Theology and for the, for the church resources. Um, he is also uh, the provost for Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And I have to say this, Jason, probably the most offensive thing about you is that you're a Yankees fan, but we won't hold that <laughs> too much against you. So, Jason, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you on. Thank you for making it time in your schedule. What can you tell us about George Lyle? Well, thanks so much um, to you both. I, I've uh, always enjoy uh, hearing uh, your podcast and also the opportunity to, to come on with you. And uh, George Lyle is such a fascinating figure uh, to discuss. And really, the work recovering his life and thought is in some ways just beginning. And there's not, not, a, lot, not a lot out there. So to try to piece together is a noble task. Uh, I've tried to do that in small ways. Others have done it in large ways. But uh, he is a helpful figure to recover. 
um, mainly because I do believe he's the first American missionary. And if not the first American missionary, also uh, <clears throat> perhaps even predating Kerry, as well, happy to explain. Yeah, give us a little bit of a background of bio. I don't know a lot about him. Um, our, our listeners, you're probably in, in the same place as, as I am, you know, uh, across the board, American evangelicals, we're just not great at church history, but maybe you've heard of William Carey. Maybe you've heard of Adoniram Judson. If you grew up in a church where those stories were told and those quotes were used by them, but George Lyle, I got to imagine very few people have heard of him. So who is this man? Well, he lived in uh, about the time of, of uh, Carey and Judson. So roughly in the 19th century or the 1800s, he was uh, born in 1750, but, you know, really making his mark as far as, you know, missions is concerned in the later part of the 1700s. Um, he would eventually leave uh, America uh, for Jamaica, crossing cultures as a missionary. That gets into the part, and perhaps if we have time here in a minute, it would be fun to discuss this whole who is the first concept, because I actually yeah. have a different way of, of thinking of that. Yeah. But he was um, born as a slave in Virginia. Uh, 1750. And his father, in fact, was thought to be the earliest slave believing in Christ in America. Wow. Um, huh. And yeah, they were they were owned um, by a man named Henry Sharp, who took the family from Virginia to Georgia in 1770. And uh, so Lyle himself does not come to Christ until 1773, about the age of 23, uh, at a church, Buckhead Creek Baptist Church in Georgia, and this is where the owner, Henry Sharp, served as a deacon. So that's a little bit beginning of his life. Um, you know, happy to, uh, you know, pick and keep going from there or, or um, see what yeah. questions. So Henry, from what I understand, Henry Sharp was kind of an interesting guy in that he was a uh, Baptist, but he was in, in obviously an American, but during the Revolutionary War, uh, was, a, was a loyalist and fought against the American Revolution. Um, hmm. And, but, but this is, it, it's, is this common that, you know, you see uh, a slave owner at this time also wanting to see, uh, you know, the, the, the slaves that are under him know Christ? Yeah. In terms of, you know, prevalence, um, you know, it's hard to say by percentage, but, but I will say it was common in the sense of, you know, believing slave owners did often have a heart and concern for, uh, their slaves, um, hearing the gospel, um, Obviously, the ways in which they went about that was still, they're still owning the slaves and they're not, you know, obviously integrating them into any kind of worship services. But, but in some ways, the way the gospel would take root among, amongst the slaves was it was being communicated uh, to them by their owners. And of course, they're, they're finding out of the gospel from, from one another mm. uh, as the slaves have, you know, were moved around or, or different things like that. So it, a lot of the way Christianity took root, it came in a variety of ways. It did sometimes come come through owners, but it quickly became um, among uh, the slaves a a source of deep hope and abiding ability through faith in Christ to persevere through those terrible circumstances. And you know, as we know throughout throughout history in this time, the the rich history of these African American spirituals and hymnody would develop really out of them you know, as they're working together, singing songs of what they knew about faith in Christ. And that tradition became so much a source of hope, hope for mm. them uh, during this time. Uh, speaking of hope, um, Jason is also the author of Mere Hope. And we've uh, had a previous conversation with him on this show about that book. We'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, but getting to George Lyle. So he became the first missionary or or not. How, how do you track what the, what what first would mean? Because you mentioned you had a different way of approaching that. Yeah, I I, uh, I think it's helpful to think through there. And, and when I think of this debate, and again, I teach classes like the history of the Baptist or the history of, of Christian missions and, you know, have an interest in these things. And one of the ways I approach it is I use the um, the very old Abbott and Costello skit, who's on first, you know, and and, and if if depending on the age of your listeners, they're not familiar with that, they can easily obviously Google it and and, and see it. But in that skit, you know, there's basically this confusion that happens by them talking about baseball, uh, baseball team who the players have the names who, what, and where, and they're trying to figure out who, who, you know, who's on first, but they end up talking past one another. And that's what I think is often happening in a contemporary discussion about who was the first missionary. 
uh, in recent days, we, a lot of different scholarship, um, you know, will obviously point to Kerry. Historically, it's the father of modern missions. Um, you'll have some who will come along and, and rightly see Lyle as playing a part. We'll want to call him first. Uh, Adoniram Judson uh, fits in there this time, leaving America and joining the modern missions movement in, in 1812. Where does he rank? And while I think it's helpful from a historical perspective to get that chronology right, and especially as it relates to Lyle, um, because I do think chronologically, you know, if you, you put a date on the year in which he's crossing cultures to take the gospel from one culture to another, that does predate Kerry, uh, certainly predates Judson. I think we actually limit Lyle and his impact and all that he is just simply by giving him the title of who is first. Um, so so I, if you want to get the chronology right, I think it's right to call Lyle first. But at the same time, I don't want to demote Kerry uh, because in the sense of, of really being a pioneer and one that launched a movement that other people would follow, he is a father in that sense, the mm. father of modern missions. Um, Kerry obviously organized churches to to create a mission society to send him. Lyle was not able and, and did not do that. Uh, Judson similarly did that as well. Mm. Uh, but, you know, Alex and Scott, I think I think the right way to think about the chron- chronological focus in this whole thing and, and to really rightly appreciate George Lyle is to think about him and the start of modern missions the way we think of other eras in history. Um, for example, when we talk about the Reformation, we talk about that as a movement. Rarely do you hear people really getting caught up on who was the first reformer. Uh, Mm. You know, we have some ideas at Martin Luther in 1517, but no, we think of it in terms of movements. You know, there was a a movement in Germany, then the movement spread to Switzerland, then there was a movement in England. And I think that's actually the better way to to think about missions. Yes, uh, you know, Lyle contributes to a movement. And so instead of a, um, you know, a a linear way of thinking of it, I almost think of it like a symphony or what I call a symphonious way of thinking about the beginning of modern missions. You have these different movements. Lyle comes in and is sounding notes, moving from America uh, to Jamaica. He does that first. Kerry, Kerry comes in and does it loudly, mobilizes a whole continent and in, in, in that part of Baptist churches, and then Judson you know, follows through. And if we think of it that way, I think Lyle's impact actually shines a bit brighter than just merely giving him the award that he was first. Yeah, their movements orchestrated by the Holy Spirit, right? You know, that you can't pin it all just on on one man. And and the Reformation didn't start in 1517 with with Luther. So I think that's a, a helpful comparison. So going beyond that, then what what was the longer impact, the lasting impact of George Lyle? What what did he leave behind? Well, he you know he was a a man who like all of us who have repented of our sins and put our faith in Christ is was a man in indebted to and who loved the gospel. Um, at that age of 23, when he was converted, he uh, would later share with an English Baptist pastor named John Rippon, uh, who would record in the English magazine, the Annual Baptist Register. That's part of how we even know about Lyle, is Lyle regularly corresponded with English Baptists, told them about what was happening. And at later in life, he would recount of his conversion. And, and I won't... Um, go into full professor mode here, but I do want to read just one little bit Mm -hmm. because it's so sweet to hear, um, you know, how he was thinking about his own conversion. He said in those days when he was 23, the more that I saw, I was condemned as a sinner before God till at length I was brought to perceive that my life was held by a single thread. I saw my condemnation in my own heart and I found no way wherein I could escape the damnation of hell only through the merits of my dying Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I felt such love as my tongue was not able to express. After this, I declared before my congregation of believers the work which God had done for my soul, and that same minister baptized me. And so you see in Lyle, this um, slave who comes to Christ, um, he is processing through the life, death, and burial resurrection of Jesus Christ, much like every other uh, believer uh, in 2000 plus years of history and coming to, to love his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, um, and this would put him on a path uh, to, um, <clears throat> to eventually begin to take the gospel from there uh, to uh, Jamaica. You know, when we read, you know, stories of 
of the suffering of our like kind of our missionary fathers, so to speak. I don't, I don't know if the right term we need to we need historians like you to come up with a better term. We have the church fathers, what we call these old missionaries, but um, I'll just call them the missionary fathers for today. Uh, these the this new wave of of missions that was happening, and we hear about their sufferings. You know, with Adoniram Judson, we often think of you know the loss of his wife's, uh, particularly Anne, and. And we think of William Carey and the su- the suffering and deprivation of his of his family and the things that he was going through. But with Lyle, it was a very different situation in that you know here he was uh, a he, he was a newly freed slave. I, I, I had read that his his master actually had sl- had freed him before the Revolutionary War. Then as then he died during the Revolutionary War, and he was very afraid of being recaptured and put back into slavery. That's part of the motivation to leave America, but. But he gets to Jamaica, which is a totally new country for him, a new place, and immediately begins preach begins preaching, uh, and and you as you described, you know, reaching out to these Baptists in uh, in in um, in England for support and for help. But but boy, it, it's hard to 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 really get our mind around the 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 danger that was involved with um, a black pastor and black missionary preaching and traveling with constant threat of being brought back into slavery. So there really is a, an amazing story of, of, of heroism, even in continuing to preach the gospel and be ineffective um, despite the risks that were associated at that time. Um, Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's, that's why part of just recovering him as merely being more than the first is so important because and you, you've recounted the history quite well. 1775, he is set free by Henry Sharp just before the revolution, and he helps actually gather a new church, the Silver Bluff Church near Savannah, which becomes the first African-American Baptist church in America. Wow. Um, he's part of that. And then with the Revolutionary War, that is what takes him to Jamaica. And he, he does what he just finished doing in Georgia. Once he fulfills his financial obligations, now as a free, free slave, he starts gathering a new church. and um, and he, doing it bivocationally. He's working as a farmer, um, but then gathering a new church there. And it's a cross-cultural. He's gathering a church among Jamaicans and among those among those who are there who will gather with him. Now, we, we have to head to a break in just a second, but something I'm wondering, did, did somebody like William Carey know about him or did other missionaries, you know, that we've heard of, right? Had they heard of George Lyle? Was he at least active in inspiring some of those others who, who went on to found more of these movements? There's no actual documentary evidence to show that, but uh, the dates by which uh, Lyle's correspondence was published in the Baptist Annual Register by John Rippon. Um, could have been read by William Carey and likely were. Mm. So Baptist at that time in the 1790s had ability to know who George Lyle was. Uh, they would not be unaware of him. And so it's likely to assume that they were aware of this this work and movement um, in Jamaica. And then later, they'll the relationship will grow after Carey goes to India and all this. The Baptist Missionary S- Society does have connection with what's happening in Jamaica. So yeah, very much likely they were aware. Mm-hmm. Well, if somebody coming up from slavery can take a step and become a missionary, then how much more are some of those others who would have been reading those correspondences? Some great encouragement. We'll be back with Jason Dusing in just a moment, talking about the life and impact of George Lyle today on the show. Have you ever been approached by a student expressing a missionary call? For the last 15 years, Spurgeon College's Fusion program has been equipping students for missions through life-on-life discipleship, college coursework, and intensely practical training. If you know a student desiring to become a missionary, send them to Fusion at Spurgeon College as their next step. To learn more about how we are equipping students for a lifetime, visit SpurgeonCollege.com Fusion. Hi, I'm Scott Dunford, and I'd like to share with you about a new nonprofit ministry established to help churches, Christian schools, and other ministries protect children and prevent abuse. Rich Hamar from Church Law and Tax states that the number one reason that drives churches to court is child sexual abuse. I can't think of anything more devastating to these lives, their families, and our witness before a watching world than sexual abuse that takes place in ministry. The traumatic impact often leaves the vulnerable not wanting anything to do with God or his people. Our efforts toward evangelism, discipleship, and spiritual formation are not only neutralized, but shattered. 
Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention was formed to help ministry leaders understand the complexities of child protection and abuse prevention. They are establishing standards and an accreditation program that will help verify that appropriate measures are in place at your church or ministry. Learn more about them. Find a helpful and free assessment tool to help you see how you measure up in this area. Go to abuseprevention.org and click on the link for this resource assessment. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention. And this June, attend the National Conference. Go to abuseprevention.org org and register with ABWE 21 as the promo code to receive 20% off your ticket. That's promo code ABWE 21 to receive 20% off. Brooks Buser, president of Radius International. I am here with Mark Dever, senior pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist and president of Nine Marks. When you go to a culture that's a different language than yours, you're ending up in a kind of majority language that's been reached. And there are other peoples still more hidden, and it's those people who are often almost entirely unreached, and they take more cross-cultural effort. Is there a way we can better train people to have more realistic expectations of what life is like in the kind of two steps away from my culture, and be able to sustain family life with its normal difficulties there, so that there can be a long years and even decades long witness in that culture. And it seems like Radius is set up to provide that training. Radius is about reaching unreached people groups. Go to radiusinternational.org, radiusinternational.org. We're back with Jason Dusing of Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary talking about George Lyle and his impact as one of the earliest missionaries of the modern missionary movement. And before we dive back into this, you know, something that might be helpful to clarify, Jason, I don't know if you want to speak to this at all, uh, so that people aren't confused. You know, we're, we're not saying that church history started, you know, with the Protestant Reformation or with the modern missions movement whenever you would date that. Right. We're we're talking about uh, George Lyle as one of the first or one of the earliest even uh, modern missionaries. There was a lot of missions happening before that. Now, in some ways, you could argue that evangelical Protestants were actually a little bit late to the game uh, <laughs> compared to some other groups, the Jesuits. Uh, but uh, but we're, we're talking about the modern missionary movement, which which really leads to what we have today, because you have other figures, you know, men like David Brainerd, who, you know, would be evangelical by our standards today, who do precede him. Right. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, the key is the modern mission movement, you know, from from the inauguration of the church. And we see the early church forming in Acts and the letters of the epistles accounting those early instructions. We see that the church of, follows Christ Jesus as a missionary church. And that's launched forward into the early area, eras. And, and it's helpful, though, to see movements, as we've talked about, ebbing and flowing throughout history as Christians are organizing their doctrine and, and taking the gospel from, from where they are to where they find themselves. Sometimes they are, you know, moved from what their homeland to another due to persecution and other things like this throughout happening the centuries. I, I think perhaps a, a helpful illustration is uh, in the 20th century, a church historian named Kenneth Scott Latourette, who's famous for writing a two volume church history, also wrote a seven volume history of the expansion of Christianity. So in seven volumes, he's chronicling how Christianity expanded from uh, the early churches throughout church history to the ends of the earth at that time. And so he's got a volume almost, you know, for, for different eras. But when he comes to the 19th century, it takes up three volumes, calls it the great century. So you see sort of in some ways the fruit of the Reformation, the gospel recovery, church is becoming more healthy as a result of the Reformation, allows various traditions to begin to not only just focus on their own churches for the sake of survival, but begin to um, obey the Great Commission in a cross-cultural fashion. And that happens in an expansive way uh, in the 19th century. Um, and there's a lot of sociological and, and other reasons as why that's happening at that time. You know, it's easier to travel the world than ever before then. Uh, lots of other things are happening. And so you know, we call that the modern missions movement. I mean, uh, historians like Ralph Winter will divide all of the last 2000 years into different epics, you know, and, uh, but the modern missions movement, because there's so much, um, work that escalates during that time, you kind of have to, you know, put brackets around it and call it something. 
So so why haven't we heard more about Lyle then it, when we've heard of some of these other men like Carrie, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor? Yeah, I think fundamentally there's there's, you know, documentary reasons, um, you know, aside from Lyle corresponding with English Baptists in London, you know, he's he's not writing a journal like Brainerd did. Uh, he's that's published you know, by Jonathan Edwards. He's not you know doing those types of things. Uh, he's operating in a small place, uh, Jamaica, um, and and you know working in and among slaves and other um, uh, Jamaicans. And probably the I think the biggest reason is that there is no modern uh, missions society or organizations of churches behind him. Um, you know, Carrie's Carrie reaches legendary status. A lot of that I think is well deserved, but a lot of it you know turns into hagiography. You know, making him to be almost saint like. Uh, because so many churches were were brought into an awakening of of global evangelism, you know, through his ministry, and he becomes the face of that. Somewhat the same with Adoniram Judson. Um, I think also it, it's right to acknowledge that you know because um, Lyle is is uh, originally he's you know four parents from Africa, coming out of America uh, as a freed slave. Um, you know that's not not something that historians have have rightly recognized in fair and equal ways throughout throughout history. Um, you know, that's not what happened. So it's, you know, it's really only been in the last 20 years that there's been any type of effort to grab whatever we can grab about Lyle and try to classify it. So, so you know, it's interesting, much like Carrie and the Serampore trio, um, you know, Lyle didn't work alone. Names like Moses uh, Baker and George Gibbs um, worked with him. And it's interesting just reading some of the, you know, the accounts of that time. I mean, uh, because he was because a lot of the slaves in Jamaica had never seen a black preacher. And even amongst the, the whites that were there, it, it was a quite a sensation and, and churches began swelling after, because of his work and church societies, even in Jamaica were, were started. Um, you know, he, his work was, was extensive and, and he made a huge impact in Jamaica. I even, I even saw an article, um, you know, from Jamaicans saying that he needs to be considered a Jamaican national hero for, for the work he did and the legacy of, of, of education and obviously church planting in, in, uh, in, in Jamaica. Um, but I, I'm, yeah. I'm curious, I, I, I'm curious as a historian, and, and I'm sorry, if you wanted to jump in, I'll go ahead and let you, but I do no, want to follow I, up to that. Yeah, no, just uh, just the, the point to make there. That's why I think of thinking of the modern missions movement as a symphony of movements rather than a chronology is so helpful because it allows us to begin to sort of look and see what other unsung heroes are not there, uh, you know, on, on, on both sides of, of the Atlantic and really kind of fill in the story. Like I said, we've done that, done this pretty well with the Reformation. We know what pre-reformers are. We know what those stories are. There's more people to fall. And I, I'm all for looking at history through the lens of great men and women as individuals. But I think it's also helpful to look at the broader movements. And, you know, you, you may never know what stories have yet to be told that can be told. We just haven't haven't been looking for them. And that's it kind of gets to my, you know, a question I had as we were talking. I didn't have this written down ahead of time, but you're a historian. I mean, the reason I, uh, I, my, my curiosity was piqued about George Lyle was because of some things that you had said, you know, over a year ago, and it got me thinking about, about him particularly, but I'm curious as a historian and certainly as a church historian, certainly as a Southern Baptist church historian, uh, I'm sure you're, you're not, uh, you know, unaware of the, of the criticism that, you know, Hey, uh, our theology and our church history is dominated by, you know, white, uh, supremacy or even just thinking about things through through our own cultural lens and yet and yet as a historian we do recognize hey there's there's um like you you brought up some of the things there's just not a lot of records and historians are about records and collecting paper and and letters and and putting together this so i'm curious you know one wh why do you think a story like lyle needs to be told but even as a historian i'm i have to imagine i'm not a historian but i would imagine that you as a historian you know no, there's probably hundreds of George Lyles out there or even dozens of guys that are that are doing ministry that we never really knew about because no one wrote it down. How is a historian that that really cares about telling the story accurately? Do you go about trying to reconstruct some of these things while while still maintaining, you know, historical rigor that goes into that? How do we tell the story of those who didn't get their story written down in the same way? I'm, maybe there's not a good answer to that, but I'm really curious as to your thoughts on it. Well, I, I think a lot of it is just intentionality 
but but also to have the discipline to stay within the limits. We can only tell the stories we can tell with the evidence we have. Right. And, you know, sometimes you can make helpful speculation to fill in the gaps. That's some of what I'm saying about, I think it's right to think that Carrie probably saw the letters that Lyle, that Lyle wrote. We can't say that definitively. Carrie never, never told us or it's never recorded. So as much as we can kind of close that gap and, and build conclusions on that, I think that's a faithful way of doing history um, and, 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 a, and a responsible way. But also there's just diligence in searching, you know, um, you know, ha- how, you know, very few people, you know, some some biographers and things have gone to Jamaica to try to, for example, what else is there to be found about Lyle? Are there mm. things yet to be discovered? Um, you know, a lot of it's just looking at history in different ways to tell the stories of, of, of people that, that haven't been hurt. And again, not to, again, I'm building my own symphony here by returning back to this same, <laughs> this same <Yeah>. refrain <laughs> of thinking of it as a movement, you know, rather than a a, you know, a, a line of train cars by which you have, you know, Lyle, Carey, and Judson, and that's it. No, it's, it, it, there's different movements here. And we think of it that way, you can go in and kind of see what other components contribute to this, you know, to the best of our knowledge. A few years ago, I had uh, the chance to, I, I became friends with this, uh, this African-American pastor, really historically African-American congregation, you know, so very different uh, theological stream and, and tradition than, than the one I grew up in. And, um, that was when I was preparing uh, for myself to go into missions. And, and I was told after I got, I, I preached in the church, talked about our ministry and what we were planning on doing and, and the, you know, this concept of foreign missions. And I had many people, including the pastor say I was the first missionary that they had ever met. Um, and, and, and really were, in, not completely aware of all that was going on in the, in the world of, of missions. And I, and I wonder if that just highlights the needs for, for stories like George Lyles to be told that it is, this isn't just uh, a history that only the history of missions in, in modern times, isn't just a history that belongs to, you know, the, the, uh, you know, Caucasian churches, white churches, but, but it actually has an incredible legacy going all the way back to uh, the times of slavery. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the the retelling of the lives of great women, men, women and men in history who have left their homes to take the gospel overseas, has fallen on hard times. You know, um, you know the in many ways that was a vehicle by which I believe you know God used to to call and to send more people was them following the accounts of of prior missionaries. This was. I mean, that's a lot of what, why we even know the name David Brainerd is why, because Edwards mm. published his journal and, and right. his journal from New England was taken to the ends of the earth. It was said in the early days of the modern missions movement that if you find a missionary on the field, he's likely to have two books, his Bible and the diary of David Brainerd. Wow. And, uh, you yeah. know, the reason why Carrie's called the father of modern missions is because one of his early biographers, you know, coined him as such. Right. Of Judson's life and his early biographers, it was said that this telling of his life was used often, very often to call people into foreign missions and also to sustain them in foreign missions, just the telling of his life. Right. So I think there is a place for, you know, recreating space for the retelling of missionary lives because it is, it is, I think, very foreign to, to many people today. And you don't think of people leaving everything uh, to cross cultures and um, to take the gospel to the nations as much, even though many people are doing it, just their stories aren't told. And that's the thing. Church history is full of faithful anonymous saints, but until we hear their stories, the potential for us as the church today to be mobilized into action is just so much smaller. I grew up, I think in, you know, a a generation of evangelicals where, you know, at least in the denominational background that I was in, I feel like missionary biography just skipped our generation completely. And I, I've had to play catch up in so many ways, whereas, you know, Scott at least grew up in a, a a church stream of tradition that was uh, at least seeking to honor the memory of, of men like William Carey, even if some of that was a little bit of hagiography, but um, how can people who are interested in learning more about somebody like Lyle, uh, and and the history of African American missions in general too, because it's it's something that that doesn't figure prominently. Where can they go to find out more about that? And where can they go to hear more from you personally, Jason, and other things you've written and spoken on? Well, um, the the works on Lyle are few, um, and you know, hopefully that there are there are more coming. Mostly, it exists in in different articles or in chapters and books. Um, there's one um, biography 
um, out there and I'm, I'm trying to get the title right and my name, I could send it to you and you can include it perhaps in the notes that come up with this podcast. Yeah. Um, that's out there that, that does comprise as much of the history that, that can be done. And I've found it helpful for my own work. Um, but um, but there's but there's not very much not very much for him. But I'm with you in that I you know I would love to see a renaissance in the in the in the telling of missionary biographies. Uh, it, just as a, a a quick aside, I trusted Christ as a freshman in college, and somehow I was given um, I was discipled very well. Looking back on this, and it was immediately understood that I needed to share my faith and and helped to develop a heart for the nations of the world, that the gospel was to go to the end of the earth and I was to play some part in it, regardless if I went full time or not. And somebody mm-hmm. gave me a copy of um, Hudson Taylor's biography, and I remember reading it, and him um, preparing to go to China. One of the ways he prepared was he started living like he thought he was going to have to live on the field. And so he dressed a certain way and he he gave up things and he slept in hard conditions. And there was a season in my youthful new Christian days where I got rid of my bed and slept on plywood for about eight weeks. Nice. Um, you know, just in that sense of if this is if Taylor was willing to give up his bed for the sake of going wherever God wanted him to go, I can do that too. And I just share that to say that what, what caused that? Well, reading the Bible, being discipled by my local church, but also reading missionary biography. And I think that mm. the life of George Lyle is a life that can do that too. You know, he didn't. He did, didn't oppose slavery directly in his lifetime. He sought to work with, with both slave and free, but it was his sustaining ministry there that ultimately led, led uh, was one of the contributing factors that led to the end of slavery in Jamaica in 1838. So, you know, just his mm. learning things like that and his faithfulness is, you know, is quite important. There's a lesson there too. Yeah. The, the gospel leavens cultures over time. It doesn't come in revolutionary all at once, but it is the leaven that, that leavens the lump and, and the gospel does bear fruit over time. Um, there, there's some powerful lessons there. Jason, we thank you so much for, for joining there. How can people follow Jason Dusing? Oh, well, I don't know that they need to do that, but I work at a great school called Mid- Midwestern Seminary and Spurgeon College. And we delight in having uh, students of all ages come here and join us and, and, hear and be challenged about the global mission task, even if God keeps them in the States to pastor and to work in churches, we seek to equip them to be for the church. And a part of being for the church is to sing and coming alongside the church as it fulfills the Great Commission. And uh, we're online, uh, all kinds of courses, but also uh, a delight to meet students in person in Kansas City. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, Jason. Thank you for listening. If you want to get more, go to missionspodcast.com or abwe.org slash podcast, whichever you prefer. But make sure you subscribe. Make sure that you share this with somebody who can benefit from it. And also make sure you leave us a positive rating and a five-star review that helps the algorithms favor us. We don't really know what the algorithms do, but we hear that that gets it in front of more people. People. And uh, if you have any questions or topic suggestions, send that to alex at missionspodcast.com. Until next week, thank you for joining us.